and welcome to our today's webinar on high availability streaming across multiple data centers, the dual Lambda architecture. My name is Robert Newman. I'm a principal big data solutions architect at Ultra Tenancy. Ultra Tenancy is the only Cloudera Gold partner in the Central European region. And I'm presenting this talk today together with my colleague from Cloudera, Balash Kaspar. Since we only have 30 minutes, our agenda is rather brief. I will give a formal introduction to the concept of the dual lambda architecture before, lab, before Balash is going to show you how the dual lambda architecture can be implemented on Cloudera CDP. Afterwards, we are available for questions and answers. I have operated, designed, and developed quite some large scale streaming applications in the past. And I made certain experiences and observations um, during the past years. Um, and I would like to summarize those challenges that I experienced with operating large scale streaming applications to you on that slide. <clears throat> what I found is that deploying new versions of a streaming application is a fairly complex process, given that you do not want to interrupt the data stream, especially if you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of customers consuming um, the data stream or the results of your streaming jobs. So that can be quite complicated, and you need to account for this upgrade path during design time already. When you architect the application, you need to think about how are you going to switch your streaming logic without affecting the availability of your application, because that will make your customers angry if your, if your application is not available. Also, conducting upgrades to new software versions bears the risk of failure. <clears throat> I've seen examples, for example, where Apache components, such as Kafka or Spark Streaming, in newer versions, they were buggy, and um, those bugs introduced regressions to the production deployment that were that we were maintaining that were unexpected and that were not there in prior versions. So in order to safeguard yourself against those um, regressions out of infrastructure components of the application, um, we also designed the dual lambda architecture. As I said, the expectation of your customer, especially if you operate on large scale, is that your data stream is not interrupted and always there. It just works. Deploying a new version of the streaming business logic might also bear a risk of altering the customer experience in an unwanted way. For example, if your logic has a bug that is calculating different metrics um, in a newer version than before, you might want to be able to immediately switch back to previous versions. And again, you need to be able to implement such kind of rollback on a rather short notice and without interrupting the availability of your application. There's now a question popping up for you, and please feel free um, to answer it as we go through the slides. The um, observations and experience we made with streaming applications came uh, or brought us to engineer an architecture that we call the dual lambda architecture. And it has, it has the following three goals. We wanted to have an architecture that allowed our streaming application to always be on, to be an active, active architecture that operates over multiple clusters of Cloudera in multiple data centers. We wanted this architecture to be fault tolerant. And that means that um, it had to be able to process data over at least two data centers. And you might know that operating um, Hadoop clusters over multiple data centers, that means stretching them, is a challenge and is not always supported. With fault tolerance, we also mean the capability of a system to tolerate the total failure of an entire data center without affecting the availability of the overall application to upstream and downstream systems. And with resiliency, we mean that we aim to avoid a single point of failure through a shared absolutely nothing architecture in order to be able to really isolate each and every uh, piece of interaction that might exist. Um, and that would help us with easily restoring a cluster once um, we experienced um, a failure or an unavailability um, in one cluster site through easily reattaching a new instance of the cluster to the existing state. Moving next, one um, very important concept to engineering streaming applications is the concept of idempotence. 
Um, here's why. Um, it is very important to make the distributed system resilient. Unimportant means that the repetitive application of a function to the same piece of data always generates the same result. Or formally speaking, if you have a function f of x, then the result of it must be identical to um, calling it reversely, for example, f of f of x. And you implement idempotent in your streaming application through an idempotent message ID. <clears throat> now, the trick is about the message ID. It needs to be available um, before the message enters your streaming application. It needs to be set from outside your streaming application. You will not be able to generate an ID like a random number or a GUID um, once the data entered your cluster. The, the ID or a characteristicum that allows for um, inheriting an ID from it needs to be already available before the data enters your cluster. Um, and this is a fundamental backbone of the dual lambda architecture. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, if your streaming application um, gets interrupted at any point in time, um, it is typically very hard to identify the exact point in time when it happened. Or speaking in terms of Kafka, for example, to name the exact offsets of every partition when the interruption occurred. So what you want to be able to do in order to re quickly recover and get up to speed again is you want to be able to set back your stream to whatever point in time before the interruption happened. Maybe an hour before, five days before, 30 days before. I mean, you want to be able to set it back to a state or a point in time where you trusted your system. Um, and that means that the system would start reprocessing data that it already processed. And in order to avoid duplicates, your business logic needs to be important. There's another question popping up for you. And I'm just moving on to the next slide. Introducing the concept of the dual lambda architecture to you. The concept of the dual lambda architecture is actually pretty straightforward. What you see on this slide is two data centers, data center A, and data center B. And both data centers, um, they are hosting a Cloudera CDH or a CDP stack. And in our case, they are hosting a Kafka cluster, a Spark streaming cluster, and an HBase cluster. And we call those um, clusters together Lambda Architecture A and Lambda Architecture B. Um, they are not interrelated and usually do not communicate with each other. I'm saying usually because there are variations of this dual lambda architecture that later on I can also show to you. Now, the trick is that the data um, outside on top of Kafka gets ingested twice. It gets multiplexed into both Kafka clusters at the same time. And once the, st the streaming logic that is represented here by the Spark streaming application um, has concluded um, calculating the metrics, they get stored in HBase. And on the other side of the dual lambda architecture, there is a component that we call the HBase MCC um, that is reading the data um, from, from the HBase clusters again. And I will shed a little bit more light into um, what is it about the HBase MCC and the Kafka parallel producer, as we call it, which is the component that is ingesting the data into both Kafka clusters. Now, what you can see is that we are duplexing the data. It gets processed in parallel, um, ideally, um, if everything operates normally. And then it gets consumed um, by an HBase MCC. What happens now in case of the unavailability of one of those either parts of, an, of a Lambda architecture deployment, either in data center A or the data center B, or in case of the total unavailability of an entire data center is um, that your data gets out of sync. Um, this out of sync might be in the space of milliseconds in case of normal network latencies, for example, or it might be um, hours or days in, in case of total unavailability of a component or of an entire data center. Regardless, um, you will always face a situation where your data um, is not integrated anymore, it is where it is not consistent. Basically, your two HBase clusters will see different versions of the same data. Your entire architecture is eventually consistent. 
as we would say. Um, you need to fix that eventual consistency um, on the data consumer level, which is why we are introducing the HBase multi-cluster client to the architecture. Um, the HBase multi-cluster client is actually doing nothing more than listening into both HBase clusters at the same time and applying a read correction um, to correct the consistency of the data. Basically, it's trying to fetch the same record from both HBase tables, and it's comparing those two records with each other, and it is able to identify which record is the one that is more up to date. And it's returning this record to the upstream consumers. Um, let us look a little bit into the Kafka parallel producer. By the way, here are the answers to your questions. The Kafka Parallel Producer is a piece of software component that we at Auto Tenancy developed that is doing exactly what I described. It is um, dealing with multiple Kafka clusters, at least two, um, and it is um, ingesting in parallel data into both clusters. Um, you can operate it with two clusters, with 10 clusters or 100 Kafka clusters. It basically doesn't care. So you could even replicate your dual lambda architecture and make, make a triple or quadruple lambda architecture out of it, depending on your need of availability. The background of, for, of which why we developed the Kafka parallel producer is the following. It guarantees at least one semantics over multiple Kafka clusters which the standard Kafka producer wasn't able to. <clears throat> um, if you are a little bit into the details of the Kafka producer, you will see one particularity of it. It will try to write to a Kafka cluster, and it, if it's not successful to send the data, it will get into a blocking state until either the data gets successfully written or it is hitting a timeout. In any case, this is blocking your entire thread and we had to deal with the situation um, where our parallel Kafka producers that we are launching, um, where they are blocking the IO threads. Basically, the semantics that we implemented in the Kafka parallel producer are the following. We are trying to submit to, um, to all the Kafka clusters that are configured, and after a certain timeout, if at least one of the Kafka clusters committed the right transaction, and we are going to kill all the rest. Um, we're basically killing the threat so that we can move on and that we can get um, over the IO threat blocking. Another component that's essential to um, the dual lambda architecture is the HBase multi-cluster client. And the HBase multi-cluster client is something that is very cool um, that I would like to talk to you. By the way, just in April, HBase celebrated its 10th anniversary, and I'm happy to announce that Ultra Tenancy is one of the core HBase committers. Our CIO, Jan Henschel, who you can see there is number 11 on the worldwide HBase committers list, he has, um, he has um, written an, a testimonial, which you can see when you click on the links on the slide. The HBase multi-cluster client is a project that was contributed by Ted Malaska, a former Cloudera employee who moved on and is now working for another company. Um, I talked to Ted um, a while ago at the StrataConf about the MCC, and he told me that he developed it on a weekend because he felt like it would be fun to do. Um, it is far away from being production grade and stable, that is what he admits. But nevertheless, we bought the concept and we think that the concept makes a lot of sense. And we are discussing this concept in the Apache HBase community as well. Um, the standard HBase client is not able to deal with multiple HBase clusters at a time. And the HBase multi-cluster client is, is curing this. Um, what we did at Ultra Tenancy is we basically took Ted Malaska's code from GitHub um, we invested significant efforts into making it stable, into finalizing the development and getting around some very, um, I would say, um, critical aspects of it where it gets stuck, um, it gets hang up in the middle of operations and this is basically affecting your availability. So there's quite some bugs in it um, and we fixed it for our Lambda architecture. All right, now having 
a look into the HBase multi cluster client, you can see that the HBase multi cluster client is actually adhering to the standard HBase interfaces. It is using the edge connection factory, for example, but it's providing different implementations to get the job done. And for the user, it feels like you are addressing a single HBase, but um, in, in real, it is addressing multiple HBases at a time. Okay. Here are the results of the recent poll. And lastly, um, before I hand over to Balash, who's going to show you how all this looks in, in practice, I would like to mention one use case where we are employing the dual lambda architecture that we allowed to name as a reference. And that is Germany's largest car insurance company, Hukobok. Auto Tendency, together with Hukobok, have implemented their telematics tariff based on Cloudera and based on the dual lambda architecture. And it has been such a great success um, that we are now celebrating the third year of 100% total system availability uh, with zero major incidents. So that means that the application was always available to the customers of Hokobok, and there's hundreds of thousands of drivers on the roads using this product. And there was never a single second um, of non-availability of the application due to the architectural approach that we've chosen. I can tell you that behind the scenes, there were hiccups of the application. There were partial downtimes of clusters that we were experiencing. But because we had it multiplexed and operated in two data centers, nothing of it ever surfaced to the customer. And this is the final poll for today. Before, I am happy to hand over to my colleague Balash to show you on CDP how the dual lambda architecture looks. Balash. But I hopefully you can hear me now. <clears throat> I will go through the demo and thank you very much, Robert. While my screen sharing is loading, um, I would like to just draw your attention that Q&A is now open. So please, please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A functionality. I've seen some questions already coming in. So just, just to continue um, on what you've presented, um, we now understood how to build a replicated and disaster tolerant architecture. And we want to make sure that it can be easily operated and, and monitored. And so uh, in my demo, I would like to show you some of the latest innovations from Cloudera that make these everyday tasks easier. So end of 2019, um, we have released our solution for on-premise deployments, uh, which is based on the Cloudera Runtime 7 distribution. And we call this uh, Cloudera data, data Platform, um, or shortly CDP Data Center Edition. Um, what you can see on my screen, I'm going to jump to this in a second. Just want to give you some, some details of this platform. If you are familiar with Cloudera Manager, um, you can get a sneak peek, actually. Um, of some of the services that we will have uh, available. And uh, this is actually something that we are releasing uh, very soon. So going back to the to CDP, data center is, is just one part of the comprehensive um, Cloudera Enterprise Data Cloud offering, which includes CDP Public Cloud, um, with support for AWS and Azure, CDP Data Center, and CDP private clouds, which will be released later this year. So CDP data center 7.1 um, is what you're seeing here, which we have deployed in, in a cloud environment. But in our demo, we will assume that this is actually an on-premise uh, deployment, which is um, absolutely possible. If you are familiar with CDH or HTTP technologies, this is an installable software and is meant to be running on bare metal or virtualized infrastructures in your data center. So CDP uh, the Data Center 7.1 integrates with, um, with all of the Claudia streaming products and innovations from the latest years, and she's to the comprehensive streaming platform that we have built around Kafka, Nifi, and Flip. Uh, but today, from this, we'll focus on Kafka, and I will show you the, the ecosystem that we have built around the Kafka message broker service. So what we have learned from Robert, um, we have, let's assume that we already have built um, a dual lambda type of architecture. So a uh, disaster tolerant replicated architecture. Yeah, now that we have our, our Kafka infrastructure up and running and, uh, and there's data inside, it would be good to have a confirmation that everything is running as expected. And actually, 
it's great that we have now the Screens Messaging Manager, or briefly SMM, that is meant to check and monitor Kafka. So this is what you can see here. And the SMM provides, as you can see, a single pane of glass view to the complete Kafka landscape. So I can take a look at uh, my brokers. Um, I can take a look at uh, different topics. Um, obviously, I have a few of those. We'll come back to this later. My producers, consumer groups, um, and I can also look at the application. And I can define alerts if I want to. Um, specifically, I will mention a bit more about, uh, we'll talk a little bit more, more about Streams Replication Manager. Uh, with the recent addition of this into SMM, I'm now also able to monitor replication of messages uh, between separate clusters. Uh, and these clusters can be even in different geolocations. So this is what you can see here. Um, I can also set up alerting. So I'm able to define alert policies and notifiers, and this can trigger an alert in case of an unexpected SLA impacting event, for instance. So what I can do, um, for instance, just give you an, an example. For every component that is part of a screen messaging manager, I'm able to define rules. So specific to the replication um, component, I'm able to say for my US to EU type of replication, I can say that, um, for instance, if the replication latency um, goes above um, 10 milliseconds, then I'm able to define an action. Uh, but that is something I can set up a notifier. And then the SMM will submit an alert in case um, latency goes beyond a certain threshold. Notifier is something I can set up here. And this makes the operation of, of Kafka clusters with an SLA mindset uh, much, much easier. So now we're going to work with actually two locations. So let me share, show this to you. I have two clusters running in the background. And uh, you can see this too here. And we will work now with another location since for geo replication, we obviously need two clusters. So I would like to ask you to imagine a scenario where we have, we work for a global company that is using Kafka in several worldwide locations to collect IoT data from regional sources. These could be connected cars, could be smart factories, and desktop or server computers, so logs from these computers, so could be data from smart end user devices. This is all real-time data. And all this data is organized in different topics. So this is something you can see here. We have several topics set up. Some of these are technical topics. Some of these, like the IoT one, which we'll be using, are actually um, more business-oriented. And we can actually go and take a look at take a look at these topics. So if I want to highlight it for IoT, and you will see that we have several topics. And based on these, we can um, take a look and understand what, what role they play in our overall infrastructure. So if I look at, for example, IoT, um, I'm able to see different partitions. And if I click on certain partition, I'm able to see who is producing this to this topic and which consumer groups are consuming from this. I'm able to go and explore more about this. But actually, I would like to show how Replication Manager is able to create geo-replicated topics, so actually move um, or replicate messages from one region to the other in real time. Um, as you remember the, the talk from um, Robert, this is mandatory um, to be able to start uh, um, the flow in the dual lambda um, architecture, to be able to reliably replicate messages, and to, to be able to monitor this, uh, this replication. So this is something we'll show here. Um, and it's interesting that it it's shows this as an active. It's just probably because some habits uh, have been missed. This will be good in a second. Yeah, exactly. So what I would like to, to mention here is that there are several ways um, to, to, to do actually accomplish what you want to do. Um, this, this company has two data centers, one in the US and one in the EU. And the, they already have Kafka clusters in place. Um, if I look at the brokers, you will see that, of course, in our setup, it's fairly simple. We only have one broker, but basically these are um, Brokers in two different clusters. You can see the two different IPs. So what we want to enable is um, is that uh, because the, the collection of the data is done on the regional level, um, so we are collecting IoT data from the EU sources inside the EU data center, and the same for the US. 
because this is done um, in, in the regional level due to low latency, but also to comply with local data management and data sharing regulation. We, find, we want to find a way which, which makes replication of this easy. So let's assume that we have found a compliant way to share data across the regions. And now we would like to replicate this, this data in, in real time between the two geo locations. So, so how are we going to do that? And let me just look into, a, look into detail about the replication. If I, if I uh, blend out replication here, you can see that from the US to the EU, um, we are actually pushing data. It's not an enormous amount of but with the help of Stream Messaging Manager, and um, if I have the right permissions, and of course in this demo I have those, but in a real life scenario, we have, have the right permissions to look at this um, US Global IoT, this replicated topic. I can click on it, SMM will take me to the, um, uh, to the topic details UI, and here I can look at the metrics, so data coming in, data being read from this topic, and the data explorer, I can, I can actually peek into the data and, look, and see here that and right now, there is fresh data arriving here. If I hit refresh, I'm, I'm able to see that it's being constantly populated by new data sets. And again, if I have the right permissions, I can even look and see that this contains sensor readings. Um, the interesting thing is, is that this data is actually coming from the, the EU data center. And it's being written to a local topic and now and being um, pushed to, to, the, to the US. So, what we are doing here is, since there are several ways to, to accomplish replication with SRM, in this example, we have enabled active-active replication, which means data that is produced in the US is replicated to the EU, and messages produced in the EU are created to the US. That's, that's easy. But actually, on both sides, we have an SRM cluster. And this SRM cluster is able, um, is what it does, is actually it's reading from the other region. So in this case, this is the EU data center, it's reading from the US location and mirroring data from a local topic that we call an IoT and putting mirroring data into the, sorry, reading from a, a topic that we call, we uh, see here the topics. We are reading from this global IoT local topic and we are mirroring not just the messages, but all the metadata of this topic, including consumer offsets, um, including checkpointing, and all the different meta topics that you've seen um, previously are being used by, by SRM and SRM to replicate not just the, as I said, not just the little messages and the headers, but also additional information about uh, consumers, indexes, checkpoints, etc. So now that we have this mirror into this global IoT, uh, you can see actually data coming in. And what we want to do is, um, is we want to make sure that this is also working the other way around. And this is something we haven't done yet. So if I go back again to the replication and to look at here, actually I want to show you both sides. If I look here, you see that while there is data being fed into the US global IoT topic, there is no data in the EU global IoT topic yet. So data from this local global IoT topic is not being mirrored yet. Um, however, setting this up with SRM is a very quick task. And this is what I want to do. So you can set this up in, uh, in different ways. And as I see, you can now, this is just, this is just one way. Um, I can show you that I configured this in the last day, so actually an hour ago, a day ago, um, I didn't have replication ongoing. And when I spin this up, you can see that the throughput went up for a short time. This is when initial messages have been synchronized. And then ever since I am, I am I'm loading data, and what you see is basically just the metadata, the heartbeats that, that are um, using some throughput and have a certain latency. However, as I said, I'm not pushing any data. So how can I easily do this? How can I easily uh, accomplish this? This uh, I only have NiFi for that. So what I want to show you is that we are using um, Apache NiFi to accomplish duplication of the local or, or regional events in the EU or in the US, respectively, to write these into the geo-replicated Kafka topics. And actually, with the power of NiFi, this can be done on the fly. And we are also able to apply real-time transformations to this data. And this is what I'm going to show you. So um, let's assume that I have different IoT sources. Actually, here I'm reading from Minify, um, another Cloudera product, which we'll not talk about in this uh, webinar. But actually reading from Minify app sources, I'm collecting that data and centrally in, the, in my cluster and pushing this through this uh, processor with this subflow. And in this subflow, what I'm doing is basically I'm um, um, 
setting up a schema name, obviously in your situation, a schema would be applied already to the, to the, the messages. Uh, I can do arbitrary transformations here, but with NiFi, I'm basically replicating the messages and writing it to the local IoT topic. And let's say this is an internal topic where my internal analysts um, are working with. I can attach to NiFi any other um, additional processing logic as I want. But currently, I'm collecting this in a local IoT topic. And I'm collecting this in another local topic, which is meant for replication. Um, because of this, this is meant for application to the EU. This is what I mentioned that data policies could come into place. I would be able to add further transformations along the way, like anonymizing data or removing data, which is not relevant for global replication. So it's actually quite flexible. And as you can see, if I look into the details, I am still right into the same local cluster. You can note that this is actually a, a local host name. While if I go to the EU side, um, you can see that this is actually right into the local um, topic one. So what I'm going to do, and this is actually real, real time, so you can see that in the last five minutes, I had data coming in. And if I use the, the data provenance feature of NiFi, I can take a look and, and uh, very briefly you know, look at the messages that are coming through this. And so for example, if I look at data provenance, look at the different events, and I can go to the events, click on information, and, and even look at the content if I want to. Again, if I have the permissions for this, I'm able to look at the, at the content. This is the same content that I could see from SNM. So to accomplish the replication, I will briefly just use copy and paste. Edit this briefly and say this is no longer writing to the local EU, but is writing to the global IoT topic. And I'm going to change the properties. Right? This is where I can configure the topic. And I'm just going to change this to global IoT. A local topic of the same local Kafka cluster. And click it apply. Now, all I need to do is make sure that um, I have here a termination. So if something goes wrong, um, I can do a further error processing here. And also want to route the messages from the previous uh, processor to this one. And now it's done with a few clicks. I just hit start. And then in a few seconds, I will be able to see that actually there's data flowing through this. So if I hit um, if I hit refresh, you will see that there is actually data going through. OK, so what happens in the stream messaging manager? If I go back here and again hit refresh, I think, OK, the data is too small to actually see the throughput. But if I open up the topic and go to Data Explorer, um, we will see that now, um, now I have data. Now I have fresh data coming in. So you can see that this has been stopped. I've been playing around, making sure everything works today, works today morning. And now if I hit refresh, you will see that there is um, fresh data coming in. And this data is actually, as you can see, is that this data is born here on the EU side. So again, if I filter to IoT and go here, and sorry, if I go to overviews and go to IoT, this is the global IoT topic. Um, I can go and look at Data Explorer. You will see that this is the exact same data that is being mirrored from EU to the, the US. So thank you very much um, for staying with me. This is a demo that I wanted to show you. I'm going to end now my screen share, and I will open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Balash. Um, people can stay on for um, the questions here. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, the first one is, uh, who or what is doing the multiplexing? Is the producer somehow taking two uh, to two clusters, or are there brokers of both clusters interacting somehow? Robert, I think that's an, a question for you. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. So the multiplexing is done by the Kafka parallel producer. And it is writing to two, let's say, in that case, to two Kafka clusters at the same time. And the Kafka cluster could consist of any number of brokers. And it's ensuring delivery semantics. Uh, it's configurable. You can say at least once or all these kind of things as well. 
Perfect. Thank you, Robert. Um, and I think another one for you. Um, do you plan to open source the HBase MCC uh, improvements that were made? Actually, we've been thinking about that, and it depends a little bit on the feedback and the interest that we receive for the HBase MCC. We have suggested the HBase MCC to be included with standard HBase with the Apache community, um, and we, we are committing into that. It has been heavily discussed in that community. And um, the approach that we're going to follow in the Apache community will be rather to re-engineer the existing HBase client and make it, you know, probably uh, be compatible with multiple HBases than using the HBase MCC. So, in case you're interested in using the HBase MCC, please feel free to reach out to me afterwards, and then we will see what we can do. Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, another one for you. Does Kafka Parallel Producer cause uh, uh, loss of log ordering. How can you handle log ordering uh, guarantee when you use your parallel producer, like partition management, etc.? That's an excellent question, actually. Um, the architecture or the dual lambda architecture is eventually consistent. Um, so there is great potential for, for losing log order guarantees um, across both Kafka clusters. If that is important to you, I would advice to um, to get in contact with me or revisit the concept. Other than that, there are possibilities um, to keep both H bases in sync at least. And um, I think we have another question that is targeting that, um, where I can explain how this is done. Okay, and before we hand over uh, to Balash, uh, one more question for you, Robert. Uh, any recommendations on handling HDFS rights across multiple data centers? Oh, yeah, that question. Um, so um, the beauty about HBase is that it can deal with um, existing data records um, in its put. Right? If, an, if a record is already there and you put on the same row key, then it will just get overwritten. Um, if you want to have the same behavior, and we're doing this um, to, to ensure that we don't have data duplicates, right? If you want to achieve the same behavior with HDFS, this is for sure possible, but this is nothing that comes out of HDFS and that you would need to code by yourself complicating the architecture. And also in case of a streaming application where you want to have low latency, I would recommend staying away from doing that with HDFS and going with HBase. Okay, thank you. We got time for one more. Um, Balash, I think that's for you. Um, is CDP 7.1 available now? Yeah, thank you for the question. So we're talking specifically about CDP data center. So CDP public cloud is something that I didn't touch. That's something we released uh, middle of last year. CDP 7.0 is what we released uh, towards end of last year. And 7.1 was meant to be available in the end of April, but because of the current um, challenges around the COVID situation, this has been pushed back by several weeks. So I, would, uh, I wouldn't make a commitment here, but our plans is to release this. Through, um, through May. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Robert, I think I got one more here for you. Um, any benchmarks done on the performance and uh, throughput? Yeah, yes, yes. So, performance and throughput is the same as with a single Lambda architecture. Um, it has no impact on the performance because um, it's basically executing the same business logic twice. The performance stays the same. Perfect. That's um, great. The so last question. Oh, <laughs> the last question uh, before we are going to close this webinar is: uh, How is the global IoT topic configured on the two clusters, EU and US? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So here in my example, I only have um, single node clusters. So I only have one broker. So it has a, it's a very basic um, configuration. I'm just using um, ten partitions and uh, and the replication factor of one. But of course, in a production setup, you would have a lot more partitions and at least a replication factor of uh, so my replication factor of three, would, for example, would be a, a good example. Um, with the usage of, of stream replication manager, you can maintain this or you can set your replication factor for the target topic as well. So basically, um, for this replication, it, it's it's not a specific. It doesn't have any specific configuration. Actually, the global IoT and the other the, the normal IoT uh, have the identical configurations. We are then using SRM, which is based on Kafka Connect um, interfaces, to then read from the variety topic. And we are creating the other topic, a uh, replicated one using SNM, and then we are populating it with data, metadata using SRM. 
which is a tool which you were using to show the cluster metrics. And this is what um, I mentioned in the beginning. This is Cloud um, Streams Messaging Manager, which um, used to be a separate um, product offering, part of Cloudio Dataflow. Um, I'm happy to say that this is now part of the CDP Data Center 7.1. So if you are able to deploy this, then you are really getting the SMM and SRM services with the with CDP Data Center already pre integrated. Great. Robert, Balash, thank you for answering the questions and your presentations. Um, if there are any more questions that come up um, after we close for this webinar, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to Robert, to Balash, or to your account executive or any of your contacts within Cloudera uh, or Auto Tendency. Um, and with that, I think uh, we can close off. Anything else that you would like to add, Robert or Balash? Just my thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you very much. And we'd like to see you at one of our next webinars, which you can find on our website. And uh, please uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. And have a nice day.